Hello everyone, this is Jason Wong from Red Hat. So today I will talk about how to achieve hyperscalability via VDPA. So here is the outline. First, we will review the VDPA architecture, and then I will discuss the demand for the hyperscalability and its four major challenges. And then I will give a status and summary. So from the hardware perspective, the VDPA device contains the following uh, parts. First, it should contain all the vertical features and molecules, and then it may contain the host features. And what's more important, all this stuff was done in a vendor specific config, and it also allows the, the vendors to have some add on features. So, we have several uh, VDPA devices right now. For example, we have Intel N3000, which is just a, a normal uh, PCI devices or virtual function. It can do both block and networking. And we also have Manlock CX6, which is a VDP implementation on top of the specific hardware and architecture. So it only supports networking so far. And third is the virtual PCI. So in that, we can treat virtual as a vendor. So technically, it supports all virtual devices. And we are also developing a user space VDP device, which is called VDUse. So the work allows you to implement VDP devices in the user space. The work will start from the block devices. And what's more interesting is that uh, we also have a VDP simulators, which is currently VDP simulators. And we have the plan to make it ready for the production environment. So it supports block and networking now. And we are pretty sure that there are more VDP parents on the road. So from the virtual architecture, you can just treat the VDP as a can of the transport. So that's the VDP software architecture. So you can see that the cross concept is the VDP bus, which allows several different VDP drivers and VDP parents to be attached. So in order to support user space driver, we introduced the vhost VDP driver, which connect VDP devices to the vhost subsystems and present her simple virtual devices for the user space driver. So the major use case for this is the, uh, the virtualization, and it can also serve for the uh, DPDK applications. And from the another part is the virtual VDP, virtual VDP bus driver. So it connects the VDP parents to the virtual kernel drivers. It allows the applications to use the VDP devices as if virtual devices. So the main use case for this is for the containers and bare metal. So as the densities of the workload grows, so we see the demand for the hyperscalability. For example, we see the containerized workload becomes popular. So usually uh, the cloud vendors requires to scale in the VDP instance to 10K or even 1000K. And we also see the requirements for fine grain uh, unit as a VDP. For example, um, we, may, we may want to split or slice uh, a VF. And then we also have this flexibility. That means uh, the VTP hardware device instance should be provisioned. And hardware should have the ability to group their units dynamically. So this can save a lot of software resources. So here are the main challenges. So first is uh, how to uh, achieve the fine grain or lightweight VTP instance. And then we need to provide a secure uh, DME content for each VDP instance. And we also need to try to think how to scale the inter interrupt. So the major limitation is the PCIe. So it only allows about 10K, sorry, 2K of MSX uh, entries. And also we need to provide the interface for the management layers to provision the VDP instance. So we will first discuss uh, how to achieve the lightweight VDP instance. So uh, we are uh, have some basic uh, uh, methodology. So the first is uh, the VDP instance should occupy as minimal resources as possible. So for resources, it probably means both the hardware resources or transport specific resources. When we also believe that the software can scale better or easier than hardware because we have much more flexibility in the software than the hardware. That usually means some kinds of the mediations 
in the software is a must. So I will use the virtual net as an example. So let's see how it was implemented in, this, in PCI. In this figure, you can see that there's a gas opening systems, which has a virtual net driver. It used the transport driver to talk to the uh, device model that is implemented in the VM app. So in our case, it's, it's the VDP subsystem plus the QML. And the VDP subsystem will talk to the real hardware. So in this case, it, it's a virtual net PCI devices which implement the interface for the basic facilities through the PCI bar capabilities and PCI link. So if we try to scale uh, what we call PCI instance, it's something like this. So usually we will have more uh, what we call PCI devices, which each what we call PCI devices will have a PCI bar capability and each we have our TX and XQ pairs and an operational CBQ. So alternatively, uh, we can do that virtual net via the VDPA. So it's something similar to the virtual net PCI hardware. But the difference is that instead of using a PCIe transport, we can use a vendor specific control or transport to replace the PCIe bar and capability in this case. So the first thing we can do that is tries to save a hardware controlled queue. That means we can prevent a software controlled queue in the VDP subsystems. So that means the CVQ queue features could be implemented in a vendor specific way. So the VDP can still let the guest know, assume that it has a controlled queue, but in its uh, vendor specific driver, it will translate the controlled queue commands to the vendor specific interface. So that means we save a one uh, hardware word queue. So you can see that in this case, there will be, if we want to scale uh, the VDP instance, there will be no need for the control queue in the hardware. So those resources could be used for more TX and XQ pairs. So another approach is to introduce the concept of the management device. Management device provides vendor specific control for transporting the managed device. That means um, there's no uh, direct vendor specific control for the management of the Instead, if the driver or the operating systems try to configure or prop the VDP instance, it must be done via the management device. So this helps to keep the VDP instance as minimal as possible, but it introduces the complexity in the management device. So you know that you can see that it's just a balance. Yeah. And another drawback is that it probably complicated the software part, which means we need some synchronizations in the management device driver to synchronize the concurrent uh, request for configuring the management VDP devices. So that also means we probably need some QoS in the management interface. So you can see that through this way, uh, if we scale more VDP instance, all the uh, configure or transport specific commands will be wrote into the management device driver. And the management device driver will talk to the management uh, functions that is implemented in the vendor specific management device. And the vendor management device will in charge of uh, sending or implementing those functions or dispatching the, the semantics to the management VDPA. So you can see that in this way, there's no direct uh, vendor specific or transport specific resources to be allocated to each management VDPA devices. It can help to save some resources. So uh, based on our previous discussions, it's not hard to infer that we can add those support in the virtual spec. So basically it means uh, we need to introduce the transport specific support for device command capabilities. And or we can also introduce the management device in the transport specific way. Or we can also introduce the wood queue as a transport. That's basically something like the management wood queue. So here's the device specific command capability. So you can see that uh, we can introduce a new capability which 
used to accept the commands from the driver. So the actual commands and command specific date is device specific. But for VirtualNet, it's not hard to imagine that this is a replacement or alternative for the control queue. So with the hardware implement this capability, there's no way for them to present a hardware control queue. But you can see that um, it's just a partial transport because for control queue, um, we can have a variable and soft command specific date, which cannot be done in the PCIe bar. Yeah. So it means we have less flexibility, but usually the 256 byte command specificity should be sufficient. And it also means that we save one boot queue. We can also introduce the managed device capability in the virtual spec. It's as simple as introduce a new capability. And in that capability, we will introduce a device selector, which means which kind of the managed device that the, all the PCIe capabilities refers to. For example, if we want to configure the boot queue zero address for the managed device one, first we need to write the one to the device selector, and then we need to write zero to the queue selector, and then we write the actual queue address via the queue descriptor low and also the queue descriptor high. And this interface can also be used for configuring the management device itself. So that basically means uh, we just write zero as device selector, and then we can keep or config the management device as zero. So as you can see that uh, when we implement the management virtual PCI driver, we need to root all the um, configuration and the probing command from the VDP to the management virtual PCI driver. And then the management virtual PCI driver will talk to the management capability that is implemented in the virtual PCI devices. This helps to save all the transport specific resources. Alternatively, we can have wood queue as a transport. It means we will have a dedicated wood queue for the management device. So here's the basic layout of the commands. The most important part is still the device selector. And then we will have the class command and the date that is specific to each command. So the commands is basically used for transport the basic virtual facilities for the managed device. And the management device is still propped in other transport such as PCI. So the uh, advantage of this approach is that it was not specific to any uh, current PCI transport. And it has more flexible uh, than the, uh, the bar or capability based uh, uh, approach because uh, there's the, the length of the date is variable. Yeah. But, as, but it has several disadvantages. For example, um, it's more complicated yeah. and it may require the quality of services because it could be used by uh, several thousands of the VDP instances in parallel. So here are the basic commands that will be implemented in the uh, management node queue. So you can see that we will introduce command for getting the features, getting and setting the device status, device generations, configurations, and some mode queue configurations. And also what's important is that we need to set and get the MSX entries per managed device. And we also need the device to implement the new notification area which could be mapped directly to the user space. So you can see that if we adapt the management of the queue, all the device configuration requests will still route from the VDPA to the management virtual PCI driver. And then the virtual management virtual PCI driver will talk to the management of the queue. Okay, so we can talk about the second challenge. That is how to provide a secure DME contact for VDPA. So the main requirement is to isolate DMAs among VDP instances. So there are three methods. The first is to leverage the transport or platform specific method. The second is to reuse the vendor specific uh, facility. And last is try to isolating at the portal level. So for the transport specific method, we can take PCIe as an example. 
It's not hard to imagine that we will use the process address ID, space ID as a parsed. So it means uh, they probably need to assign parsed per VDP instance or even the parsed per VDP instance per queue. That means we need to platform LM support for the parsed. And the VDP vendors is in charge to implement a vendor specific way for configuring the parsed. So you can see that uh, it's not hard for the vendor because it can leverage the platform features. But the vendor needs to wait for those features to be implemented in the vendor first. And it's also the platform dependent. For example, the parsed is tied to the PCIe. So another method is to vendor specific matter. So an example is to have the device MMU. This means the device has its own MMU, which is used for translating the IO virtual address with transport specific DM addresses. That means the DMA could be isolated as the, at the VDP instance level. We can tag different VDP instances as different uh, uh, address space. So the isolation was done in the device itself instead of depending on the platform specific MMU. And it can choose to work with and without any transport specific DMA isolation method. For example, it can co-work co with the parsed or not. So the advantage is that it's a platform independent and it's more much more flexible flexible. But the drawback is that it's a little bit complicated for the vendor to implement it. So actually we can borrow those ideas and implement those functions in the spec. For example, we can add spec support for the transport specific DMA isolation method, or we can even introduce DMA isolation at the vertical level. So for the transport specific support, we can add the spec support for the PASI assignment. So it's as simple as we can introduce a PCI PASI capability, and then we can introduce an interface for how to configure it in the PASI per queue. So in that case, we can align pass it for each virtual net instance or each word queue. And then if it was used with a pass it capable MMU, we can achieve DM isolations at the VDP instance level. So it's simple because it leveraged platform features. And it's also standard because it was in the spec. Uh, some drawback is that this was platform independent, but it's probably not a big issue. Or we can even consider to implement this, the device MMU in the spec. So the DMA is translated then into two stages. The stage one is the translation is done in the device MMU, which translates the IO virtual address to the intermediate address. And the stage two is the platform MMU, which translates the intermediate address to the physical address. And we can also have the two possible interface. It could be a queue based or pay table based. So the advantage is that it's platform independent. It can work with any transport. So it's more flexible, but it will be more complicated in the for the implementation. So another interesting topic is how to scale the interrupt. So we may meet some transport limitations. For example, in the PCIe, it only allows 2K MSIX entries per PCIe devices. And for the MMO transport, it does not even have MSIX support. So what we want to see is first to introduce the MSIX support in a general virtual way, or we can try to scale the number of the MSIX entries. So for BDP vendors, it's basically about how to store the MSS entries in a vendor specific way. So it means we need to introduce the interface for the drivers to config, to mask or unmask the MS entries in a vendor specific way instead of using the standard PCIe uh, MSS table. So for the spec, it's as simple as introduce uh, MS configuration capability. And in that capability, we will have the functions to program the MS vectors per device per board queue. Okay, so the last requirement is the VDP provisioning. So you can see that in the VDP framework we have implemented 
those provisioning interfaces via the netlink. So the management layer is in charge of specifying the, some attributes during the device creation. So the provisioning will be done at the VDP parent level. So they can borrow the ideas and implement those in the virtual spec. So it basically means we need to implement or extend the current managed device capabilities by allowing the device provisioning to be done via that interfaces. So we can introduce some dedicated registers for storing the config. And we can introduce the registers to create or destroy the devices. And we can also uh, get the command status from a dedicated registers. So for example, if we want to create a VDPN uh, on what health devices, first you need to write those uh, configurations to the config registers, and then you can write a one to the create registers. And then if you read zero from the creator, okay, it means that the managed with devices has been successfully created. Okay, so here's the summary of these discussions. First, we discussed several approach to scale the VDPA instance, to scale the secure LML context and interrupts and provisioning. And it does not mean that it's, they are only the approach for achieving the high scalability. So other technologies may also help. For example, we can introduce the technologies like device sharing or scheduling, which means we can schedule several different uh, guests or containers uh, among a single VDP devices. And we can also leverage the transport specific way to use some technologies such as the shared word queue, which means a single word queue could be used by several different DMA domains. But none of those approach comes for free. So it's the charge of the vendor to balance the pros and cons and choose a uh, a suitable ways for having a hyper scalability. Here are some references for the RFCs that has been posted on the list for the discussions uh, in this talk. You are welcome to review and comment on this series. And we have prepared a GitLab website which contains all the necessary information for VDPA. Please visit the website for more information. Thanks.